Uh, good morning, everybody. If you're in Singapore, good morning. If you're elsewhere, good whatever time of the day it is. My name is Tio Yu Yen, and I'm one of the editors of Academia SG. Welcome to Academia SG Singapore's uh, Singapore Studies uh, Junior Scholar Seminar Series. Uh, if you're not familiar yet with this series, we started it with the intention of providing a platform for scholars at early stages of their careers to present their work in progress. Uh, last year in 2021, we hosted eight seminars from scholars in a wide range of disciplines who are working on deepening our understanding of Singapore society through quite varied empirical approaches and theoretical lenses. Um, it was very exciting to see so many people working on very different and interesting projects and judging from the quality of the talks as well as the discussions that followed, it's obvious that we have a lot to look forward to in the years to come as our young colleagues continue in this work. This year, um, we can look forward to more people sharing their work. There are already four talks, including today's, lined up in March and April. If you are new to the Singapore Studies uh, Junior Scholar Seminar Series, please check out our past talks on our website, Academia SG, or on our YouTube channel. And everyone, please look out for future events and continue to sign up and join in. Um, having an engaged uh, audience keen on asking questions and providing feedback to our speakers, this has been really crucial to the success of the, the talks. So today, um, presenting her PhD work in progress is Jacqueline Ho. Jackie is a PhD candidate in sociology at Cornell University, and her presentation, which is titled Can Every School Be a Good School, draws from her ongoing uh, PhD research. After Jackie speaks, which will be for about 30 minutes, we will hear comments from Associate Professor Aaron Cole. Professor Ko is associate professor in the faculty of edu uh, sorry the sorry most where my faculty of education at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. His research focuses on international and comparative education, global studies in education, and the sociology of education. As an expert on elite education and education policy, I'm sure he'll have um, insightful feedback and suggestions for Jackie. So after Jackie and Aaron speak, we will open things up for a Q&A with audience members for 20 minutes. Please note that the session is being recorded and to minimize distractions, we ask that you turn off your microphones and cameras while the speakers are speaking. And please hold off your questions until we're at the Q&A section um, and we will um, open things up then. Okay, with that, let me turn things over to Jackie. Thanks so much, Yuyan. Are you guys all seeing my slides? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So yeah, thanks, Yuyan, and thank you to um, Corey, Cherry, and everybody at Academia SG. This is my first time presenting to a public audience for how long I've been in grad school. I think these are really rare but necessary spaces. So really grateful to you guys for working to make these connections between academics and the public happen. And of course, thank you to Aaron for readily agreeing to be my discussion and for taking the time to think and share, think and engage with my work. Um, so as you mentioned, I'll be presenting some work in progress today from one chapter of my dissertation project. And in this chapter, I'm looking at how parents choose primary schools in Singapore when certain kinds of school information have been removed. So um, I think many of you will be familiar with these kinds of headlines about the number of primary schools going to ballot during each phase of the P1 registration um, exercise. And um, going to ballot just indicates that a school is oversubscribed. So these are numbers that I pulled from last year's reporting, but generally every year the story is the same, which is that there's a lot of competition for popular schools, right? So there are 186 primary schools in Singapore. So that means about half of the schools were oversubscribed in phase 2C, which is the open registration phase. And if you look at the data for the last few years, that's not at all atypical. So this kind of competition creates a number of issues. First, as we see here, the registration system is designed in a way that parents with certain privileges can 
boost their chances, right, by registering in these priority phases. Um, and so the more competitive a school is, the more likely that those who get in are those who have the time or money or knowledge to participate in this competition. And that also means that the more competitive a school is, the harder it is for parents living near popular schools to get in if they don't have these privileges. So um, if you look at the numbers here, you'll see that parents who register in phase 2C face the highest risk of a ballot. And so then one solution is to try and make the rules of the competition fairer, for example, by setting aside more spots for those who are not eligible for the priority phases. But the problem being that competition is a zero sum game. So if you reserve some, some spots for some people, um, that means you're taking away spots from other people, right? So whatever change you make, you're always going to have a new set of disgruntled parents. And so another approach then is to try and reduce this competition in the first place, which is what MOE has been trying to do over the past decade or so by trying to make every school a good school and to convince parents that this is indeed the case. So part of this effort involves changing the kinds of information that parents have about primary schools, in addition to, of course, making certain um, concrete changes to the schools themselves. So uh, about 10 years ago in 2012, MOE announced a few changes, including that they would abolish the secondary school banding system, modify the school award system, expand their support for schools to develop and also market their niche programs, which are basically these school-wide extracurricular programs in areas such as visual arts or outdoor activities. Um, and finally, that they would no longer publish the names and schools of top PSLE scorers. So I just want to give you one concrete example of how these changes shape the information that is available to parents today um, by showing you a few screenshots, a few before and after screenshots from iTunes School's website. So on the left, you'll see a screenshot from their 2011 version of the website. Um, and you'll see that they list the top PSLE scorers. And then below that, they also compare the school PSLE performance to the national average. Um, and now though, when you look at their website, you cannot find this kind of information. And instead, if you click on their student achievements link, um, you'll find these achievements in a whole range of extracurricular and curricular domains. And then there's also a section called Itong School Experience, where you'll find this information about Itong's LLPs or Learning for Life programs, which are one of the types of niche programs that MOE has been encouraging schools to develop. And so in essence, what we see here is that um, hierarchical information about academic quality has been removed and instead has been replaced by information about a broader set of school attributes, right? So the hope is that parents will see that there's no single hierarchy of schools and instead there are multiple peaks of excellence in MOE parlance. Um, and I wanted to know how and whether this policy logic plays out in um, parents' decision processes or processes, depending on whether you're in the US or in Singapore. Um, so I conducted interviews with 50 parents last year to try and answer these two questions. One, um, how do parents evaluate and choose schools in the absence of hierarchical school information from official sources? And second, what might account for this variation in parents' perceptions and choices? And I will give you a preview soon of my findings, but first I wanted to frame them a little bit more um, by giving you a sense of whether on aggregate it seems like parents really believe that every school is a good school. So first I will show you this chart um, of the 90-10 ratio of the subscription rate at each school. And this chart basically tells you how big the difference is between the 90th and the 10th percentiles or the most and the least popular schools. And so if parents have started to consider a range of a wider range of schools, then we should see the number of applications that each school receives evening out over time, meaning that we should see a decline in the 90-10 ratio, right? But as we see here, there's no such decline. And then in recent years, there's actually been uh, an increase. And I just want to add a couple of footnotes here. One that there are actually several justifiable ways of measuring school popularity just because there's so many registration phases. Um, and I've tried a few different ones, but um, in general, the pattern does look roughly similar to what I'm showing you here. And then also this chart is based on raw application numbers. I have not yet weighted these by the population density around the school, which does affect 
how popular a school appears to be. And that's something that I'm still working on. Um, and then I also want to show you a more specific phenomenon, which is that it's becoming more competitive to register as a school alum. So this chart here shows you the percentage of school alumni registering in phase 2A1 versus phase 2A2. So phase 2A1 comes first. And in order to register in this phase, you need to pay money to be a member of the alumni association. Whereas for phase 2A2, you can register as long as you are a graduate of that school. And so what you see here is that the competition is basically shifting upstream from 2A2 to 2A1 as more and more parents pay to register in this earlier phase. So thinking about these two charts, the question then is why does it seem like there's no end to this competition for popular schools? Um, so one explanation that we commonly invoke in popular discourse is that parents are just kiasu, right? Um, for my non-Singaporean friends out there, kiasu means afraid of losing. And a kiasu parent, it's like roughly equivalent to a tiger parent or a helicopter parent in the US. Um, and just to give you a couple of examples of what this sounds like in popular discourse. So in 2015, there was some reporting on how parents had compiled their own unofficial list of PSLE top scorers since MOE was no longer releasing this information. And this is the mothership headline about this event. And it says that this kind of behavior proves that Yasuism lives on. Then there's also the Straits Times Facebook post about um, the report. And it received many, many comments. I just pulled out one here. And the commenter says, si pe bo liao, uh, which means like, well, these parents really have nothing better to do with their lives. Um, it's, the better, it's the parents that are stressing our kids. And then finally, I wanted to show you a short clip from 2017, which is from a series of videos that's meant to guide parents on how to, how to choose a primary school. Um, let me get my volume up. And every Singaporean child is guaranteed a place in primary school. But I want my Sarah to just go to Blossom Primary. It's like the best school near our home. I mean, every Singapore school is very good in their own way. You just need to choose for Sarah uh, schools that matches her interests and her needs. So as these portrayals suggest, the prototypical Kyasu parent is competitive overly worried, and is often a woman. So Kiasuism here is essentialized, which just means that it's described as a character trait that's natural or that's innate to an individual or to a social group, rather than um, that it has developed within a certain social or historical context. And Kiasu parents here are also pathologized, meaning that they are treated as psychologically abnormal, especially as compared to those parents who are not Kiasu. Right, and we can see and we can hear this in how the man frowns at the kyasu mom in the video and says, I ling, right? So he's basically telling her that, oh, she's too worried and she just needs to chill. Um, but based on my interviews with parents, I want to suggest an alternative reading of their competitive behavior. First of all, that kyasu is not something that parents simply are, uh, but rather it's something that they become through a social process where they're exposed to certain risks and they learn that they're responsible for managing these risks. And second, even though we think of Gatsu parents as being abnormal or excessive compared to non gasu parents, they're all trying to accomplish the same thing, which is to reclaim a sense of security in the context of this experience of risk and uncertainty. So um, my findings here come from a partial analysis of 50 interviews that I conducted last year with parents who had recently or who had or who would soon register their kids for P1. Um, I can answer specific questions about my methods later, but for now, I'll just mention that most of my interviewees are middle and upper middle class parents, which I define as parents in a professional job who have at least a polytechnic diploma and a combined household income of at least $7,000. Um, and this is a demographic that's more likely to compete for high quality schools. Um, and are arguably also the parents whom MOE most wants to convince that every school is a good school. Then I will also say a little bit about my analysis process and where I am. So I've been closely reading my interviews and writing down observations related to my research questions. And so far I've done this for about half the interviews. And at the same time, I'm reading a range of literature to help me figure out um, what exactly my data is a case of. Um, and this is just loosely similar to an approach to theory generation in sociology called abductive analysis. 
And I write that my current focus on this notion of risk management, because I noticed how often parents were mentioning these feelings of uncertainty. At the same time as I was reading a line of scholarship on parenting and risk, which conceptualizes parenting choices as um, these security strategies that parents develop in response to the risks that they perceive in society. Um, and I'm telling you all this to just say that what I'm sharing today could definitely change. And um, I'm going to analyze the rest of my data next and whatever comes up you know, could change these findings. And so as you listen to this next section where I'm sharing my findings, if you think of questions about what else may be going on that I haven't talked about, those would be super helpful to hear in the Q&A. So first I will talk about the variation and how parents perceive school quality in true schools. And then I'll talk about why I think they differ. So to illustrate this variation, I'm going to introduce two mothers, Pei Ling and Yin Yin. So with Pei Ling, she, um, one year before her older son was due to register for P1, she applied to or inquired about the parent volunteer scheme at five schools. And her top choice school, she said she was interested in it because she thought the boys from that school were very charming. Um, she thought this when she was in school herself. The, other four schools were what she called famous schools in and around her neighborhood. But unfortunately, she didn't get to volunteer at any of these schools because either she lived too far away or she missed the deadline. So she could only register at phase 2C, which again is the open registration phase. So the, for the four days of phase 2C, Pei Ling took leave from work just so she could call the schools and um, observe the registration numbers every day because initially she was still hoping to register at one of these four famous schools, but because it was oversubscribed, then she finally decided to apply to another school that she said was quite good. But then on the last day of phase two, see the number of applications to this quite good school suddenly shot up because a lot of the parents from the famous school transferred their applications when they saw that it was oversubscribed to this quite good school. And so that meant that Paling only had a one in nine chance of getting in. And so in the end, she decided to transfer her application to a nearby Catholic school. That's where her son ended up. Um, and one thing to note here is that there are in fact several other schools nearby that have vacancies, but she didn't consider any of them because they are quote, not well known. So um, Yan Yan's story is a lot more straightforward, a lot less for you to listen to. Um, at the time that I interviewed her, she was about one year out from having to register her daughter. And she had not yet started about thinking about P1 registration. And she told me that she knows nothing, zero, about the schools around her. And even though other people share their opinions with her about which schools are good schools, she says that she's indifferent to these opinions. And in her words, it's just like telling me the fried chicken is nice or that nasi lemak is tasty, by which I think she meant that everybody just has their own personal taste in schools. And although she hadn't heard of the slogan, every school is a good school, she immediately agreed with it when I mentioned it in the interview. So actually, Peiling and Yin Yan, they both live in the same neighborhood. So they probably have some pretty similar schools available to them, but they perceive them differently. Um, and so where Peiling sees this very clear hierarchy of schools, Yin Yan doesn't at all. And so I think it's easy to think of these two mothers as wanting very different things in a school or having different parenting styles, but I am suggesting that they are trying to accomplish something similar, which is to construct this sense of security within a social context where they have learned to be responsible for managing risk. So just to break down these two components, I'm first going to describe how parents experience these feelings of risk and responsibility. Then I'll talk about the different approaches that they use to construct this sense of security. So um, I'm going to introduce you to an interviewee, Sandy, and I will read out a long quote from her before I show it on the slide and break it down. So Sandy uh, has a five-year-old daughter, and I asked her when she remembered first thinking about P1 registration, and she told me it was when her brother and her cousins started talking about their kids' registration. So what she said was, when they talk about all of this, it stresses me out. Like, oh no, I never think about it. Then next time my daughter lose out. Like I worry she cannot get into a good school. She doesn't have a better opportunity as compared to me. So when I think about it, I also worry as a parent that, you know, I'm not giving my daughter enough opportunities because I'm not doing enough as a parent. 
like I never volunteer in advance. Because when you volunteer, I think you need at least two years of hours, but the slots to do volunteer work is not easy to come by. Okay, so we see here that Sandy experiences two kinds of risk. One, there's her daughter's educational risk. If she doesn't go to a good school, then she'll lose out on better opportunities. Um, and then there's the risk that um, she won't be able to secure a spot in her desired school. Sorry, I'm hearing some a little feedback from someone. If you can check that your mics are muted. Um, thanks. And then, okay, and then secondly, there's the risk that she won't be able to secure a spot in her desired school. And a lot of the parents that I talked to talked about these same two types of risk when I asked them what triggered them to first start thinking about P1 registration. So then Sandy also experiences a sense of responsibility, right? She worries that she's not doing enough as a parent. And I also detected the sense of responsibility in the emotions that some other parents express when they describe their actions associated with P1 registration. So Jillian is a mom that said that she would have been fine with sending her daughter to a neighborhood school nearby, but because her husband is an alumnus of a popular primary school, they are thinking of registering there instead, though it's very far away. And surprisingly, she said that she actually wouldn't mind if Emily got rid of the alumni system, because that would save her the headache of having to make this choice. And she said, it's because now everybody is choosing. So I feel that if I'm lazy, and if I don't choose, if I don't do my homework, then I'm not doing my child justice, right? So here we see that Jillian feels guilty at the thought of not being actively involved in choosing a school. On the flip side, there are some parents who are very invested in doing the work that P1 administration entails, and Bliss was one such parent. So Bliss did a lot of research on schools, and she also served as a parent volunteer at a school of her choice. And she was quite happy with the effort that she put in, and she told me that initially she was thinking about writing a Facebook post about her P1 registration experience. So I asked her why, and she said, I just wanted to share my experience because I feel a lot of parents, they just say in words where they want the kid to go, but they don't actually do homework. So I mean, I'm very yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very show off or arrogant or proud. Um, I feel I was very hardworking. And then she laughs at herself here. Yeah. Um, so in contrast to the guilt that Jillian feels about not choosing, Bliss feels proud of her active engagement in the choice process. And note here too that um, Jillian and Bliss use the same language of homework, lazy, hardworking, which are all words that suggest that parents have agency, right? So they can take certain actions to manage these risks. And it's maybe because of this partial agency that parents do come to feel accountable for managing these risks. So in this final bit of the findings section, I will talk about the different ways that parents reconstruct a sense of security and what this has to do with the way that they perceive school quality. So first, for many of the parents I talked to, the way that they gain control over uncertainty is by working to understand where schools are positioned in a hierarchy. And I'll just use the case of Annie to illustrate. So Annie got her information about schools almost exclusively from Google searching. And she said that by searching this way, she wasn't able to find very much information about all the schools around her. But later on, when I was reading her interview transcript, I looked up the websites of the schools near her. And I actually found quite a bit of information about you know, their academic programs, their niche programs, their character education initiatives, and things like that. But all of this apparently doesn't register in Annie's mind as information. Um, so during the interview, I did ask her what information she was trying to find. And she said, I was trying to find just anything, like how the results are, how good the reputation is, whether there can be any reviews left by anybody on the schools, or like what are the awards that the school got. So if we look at the quote here closely, um, Annie, she claims to want to find just anything, but in fact, the kinds of information she's looking for, like results, reputation, awards, all of these types of information are hierarchical in nature. And eventually she did learn that two of the nearby schools had won awards, and so she decided to apply to one of them. So I asked her why this information about awards was useful for her. And she told me, 
I thought having some, I thought having more awards or having a better reputation would mean that my child may do better in that school. And of course, hopefully, after he finished primary school, he can go to better secondary school and so on. So with this hierarchical information, Annie is able to position a school as better and therefore to construct a narrative about this school leading to a better future. And this essentially is a linear narrative that provides her with a sense of predictability um, and a sense that this risky future can be known. But as we saw earlier with the case of Yin Yen, some parents are able to create a similar narrative of security, even without a hierarchical understanding of school quality. So Yen Yen is very aware that because she's not actively searching for a good school, other people might think that she's not doing right by her child. So she says, because I never do parent volunteering work and because I didn't move house and I do not actively look for an affiliated school, my girl is going through a pigsty. There's a risk here involved in her non-action. And then she also knows that parents who do actively look for a good school can demonstrate that they're being responsible and they can say confidently things like, I've done it, don't worry, I got everything sorted out. And so for her, she has to counter potential accusations of risky and irresponsible behavior. And how she does this is by telling me that she thinks it's more important for her girls to come from a loving family than to go to a good school. And so she says, I read a lot of parenting books about disciplining, about kind but firm, about positive yes mindset, stuff like that. So what I'm trying to say here is I know my two kids come from a happy family. So although Yan Yan may not be doing the homework of P1 registration, she is doing a lot of this other work as a parent. And she also says later that 100% of the time, kids learn best when they're happy. So in other words, by guaranteeing her children's happiness, she's also guaranteeing that they will be good learners. So Yan Yan's narrative of security is that her children will be successful regardless of what school they attend because they are emotionally secure. And so that enables her to maintain a sense of control about her children's future and also to feel like she's still being a responsible parent. So just to wrap up here, when we think about why this school hierarchy of popular and unpopular schools continues to persist, um, we might think that there's some pretty obvious explanations, which is what I also thought at the beginning of my research. We might say things like, oh, parents just want the best for their kids or oh, of course, everybody knows what the good schools are and they're not going to believe what the government says, right? Like, these are things that I also heard from some of my interviewees. But um, what I'm suggesting here is that the decisions that parents make, they occur within a context that defines what this one thing the best means. And this is a context where parents encounter narratives of risk about their children's futures and about the danger of being chucked by MOE to a faraway school and also about the things that they can do to manage these risks. And so, yeah, hierarchical information is about schools is no longer available from official sources, but many of the parents I talked to, they still seek it out from personal networks, from forums, and especially from parent chat groups on WhatsApp and Telegram, because it is a part of how they build a narrative of security to cope with an uncertain future. And so to understand how different parents are choosing schools in the current context, we need to ask then how different parents um, view the risk of primary school and what resources they have available to construct a sense of security. And one question that I'm personally interested in exploring next is whether these processes are classed. For example, um, some of the parents who went to neighborhood schools told me they felt that they had limited opportunities, and this was why they wanted to put their children in good schools. And on the flip side of that, the parents who are um, willing to put their kids in neighborhood schools and want to comfort themselves that it's okay, uh, it's not risky, they often draw on this big fish, small pond idea, right? Which is this idea that your children will be more confident or will have higher self-esteem if they're in an environment where they can do better than their peers. But um, I think that kind of suggests that these parents are probably accustomed in the first place to thinking of their children as big fish and as better than their peers. Um, okay, and then second, I think focusing on these experiences of 
security and insecurity also raises another question, which is which parents have greater access to feelings of security in the P1 registration system? Because I think when we talk about um, the inequality that, that, that the P1 registration process creates, we often talk about inequalities in access to schools and less often about inequalities in mental well-being. But um, as we saw with Paling's story, I think it suggests that parents who are experiencing the most stress in the process, they may be those who perceive the greatest risk, but at the same time, they lack the necessary resources to compete. Um, so Paling, just to illustrate, believes that going to a good primary school is really important because it will really affect her children's future. Um, but she didn't know enough about how and when to apply to volunteer. And as a result, as we saw, she experienced this prolonged period of insecurity during phase 2C. And she told me that she felt like her experience was really a big struggle, really a big struggle. And she was actually quite depressed during the registration process. And of course, as you may have noticed, all of the parents that I talked about are mothers. Um, this work of parental involvement in kids' education is very gendered. And therefore, the burden of managing these feelings of insecurity fall most of all on the shoulders of mothers. Duh. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for listening. I just wanted to end by um, thanking a few people, or rather many people, without whom this research would not have been possible. First, the interviewees and also some of my key informants for taking out time from their work days and from their me time to talk to me. Um, thanks also to my family for feeding and housing me while I was doing all these Zoom interviews. And um, thanks to all of you friends, colleagues, strangers in the audience for your engagement today. I'm looking forward to your reactions and your questions. Wonderful. Right. Thank you, uh, Jackie, for um, presenting really very interesting uh, findings as well as, as you know, drawing out the broad frame in which you're approaching uh, these empirical issues. Um, now over to Aaron. Um, first of all, let me thank um, the organizers, um, Sharon, for inviting me and Yuan, uh, Corey and uh, Jacqueline for inviting me to be a discussant. Um, and I, I also want to acknowledge my dear friends from NIE who are here in our midst. I haven't seen you guys for such a long time and I really, really miss you. So I, 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 I'm just going to shout out to Chini, uh, my wonderful colleague, um, Dennis, uh, my friend Edmund and uh, Charlene and Pei Tong, all from NIE. So thank you all for joining this session. And uh, it's good to see you all virtually here, even though we haven't been able to see each other in, um, in real person. And uh, I do miss all of you very much. Yeah. Okay, let me uh, begin. Um, uh, thank you, Jacqueline, for sharing with me uh, your data. Now, I'll tell you how I approach uh, your, your paper and your, your presentation. And uh, I'm going to offer a couple of suggestions uh, theoretically, conceptually, and also methodologically. And uh, where I begin is your very rich interview data that really, really uh, got me so uh, excited uh, because um, this is an area that I'm quite familiar with and I'm also I'm kind of working in different contexts. Now, so the methodology that I'm approaching from, the way I'm reading your data is really uh, what, Methodology, uh, what method, what scholars would call post qualitative, post qualitative inquiry. Okay, and there were a number of themes that actually emerged from your data, and that was how I I, I came up with a conceptual framework, you know, which I thought you might want to play with. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, from your interview data, uh, you know, there were there were there were a couple of themes that uh, I sort of predicted that this participants would say about manage, managing risk, uh, constructing security, and the notion of being responsible parents. I think this vocabulary speak to a uh, theory of responsabilization. Uh, you might want to look at Michael Peters' work. Uh, and also this theory of uh, responsabilization actually 
is that it's encouraged by neoliberalism as a concept. And something that I noticed, which you pointed out as well, is that uh, the school choice endeavor that is happening in Hong Kong, as in elsewhere in uh, Hong Kong and China, uh, have done work in these two places. They are they're highly gendered. All right. So I think you might want to talk about uh, play with this idea of mama sphere, mama sphere as school choice, and because this is their domain and the effects that goes into this mama sphere. I mean, the fear, trying to man manage risks, the anxieties that they have to navigate. So this is some some ideas that um, I thought that emerge that it strikes me from your interview data. Now, and then from um, the data that you presented, uh, I, I thought of uh, Raven Connell's work, um, the Australian sociologist um, uh, in, in her book, Confronting Equality, Gender, Knowledge and Global Change. In one of the chapters, she talks about neoliberal parents. And I really felt that what you are really searching for in terms of a conceptual vocabulary to describe this Gansu parent is neoliberal parent parenting with Singaporean characteristics. Yeah, because I think in popular discourse, we're all very familiar with Gansu parent, but I think conceptually, you want to develop this idea of neoliberal parenting with Singaporean characteristics. And I think we know that this big force, this neoliberalism, has actually filtered down to the psychic of parenting uh, in Singapore, where there's this frenzy, whether it's uh, choosing primary school or secondary school, or even in universities, you know, which one they should go. Okay. And I want to give you a quote from Cornell, and I, I quote here, she argues, uh, neoliberalism is a social cultural logic. And I, I, I emphasize, social cultural logic, she didn't say, she doesn't say it's economic cultural logic, she says a social cultural logic, a social ethos operating through a wide variety of social agents, as well as economic programs, unquote. And she also said this, which got me thinking, and I quote again, the neoliberal project is auto-formative. It creates new social realities on a wide front, and I would argue this includes uh, school choice um, in a Singaporean context. So I, uh, I would suggest that you play with this idea of neoliberal parenting with Singaporean characteristics as a conceptual framework and re-adapt uh, Cornell's idea of neoliberal parents to make this uh, paper work. You know? Now, another comment that I want to suggest has to do with school choice. Uh, I'm not sure how much you're familiar with the literature on school choice, but this is something that I've been working on for the last few years. And in the context of global middle class, mobile professionals, we've been, uh, and we, we, we studied, we interviewed parents of global middle class profession. And these parents uh, move from global cities and uh, from a, a few global cities, and they bring their families along and they have to decide what kind of schools they should send their, their children to. So uh, I think there might be something there for you to look at as well. And uh, I felt that you should also uh, canvas the literature that is closer to the Singaporean context or the Chinese context in China, all right? What is happening is uh, they have a new policy where they are trying to uh, make uh, schooling equal for uh, families from different classes. I, I don't know how to read the Chinese policy, but I, I, I kind of wrote it out, but I, I, I'm afraid I embarrass myself by reading out because some of the words I can't read. Anyway, so uh, look at China and my PhD student and myself have been writing about this, but it's in the context of international school. So you might want to look at some of our work. And then to nearer to where I'm currently working, the, the Hong Kong context school choice. Uh, it, it, it's pretty similar. Uh, there are some bits that resonate. But in the Hong Kong context, uh, school choice and class intersect, right, intimately 
So you, you mentioned in your uh, paper that uh, you will probably examine this, right? I, I don't, I think you have to because you can't talk about school choice without class because not everybody gets to choose, you know? Uh, and if you look at the way, the, the mechanisms, the system that set up for school choice in, in, in Singapore, it, it disadvantaged uh, certain types of families, social class, okay? So it, it, it looks like school choice, but uh, I would think of a different term to describe this school choice you know, because there are so many restrictions, you know, you have to fall into certain categories, then you can really have the liberty to choose, you know. And uh, a related point, it's about class, you know, and I think we've been sociologists, uh, like Yuyen, Yuyen's wonderful book, uh, which I think most of us have read, including myself. And, and I think we, we're trying to grapple with this class, that is a social class, uh, uh, reconfiguration, you know, like it's, it's so fluid, it, 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 it's changing, okay? And, you, and what my guess, okay, I think this has to be affirmed by more interview data, is that uh, the lower middle class, all right, they are the ones who are really anxious, restless, you know, they are very nervous because they, are, they, are, they, are, they're going, they have to learn to how to manage this, all this risk, you know, that's involved because uh, you, you might, uh, because getting into a primary school that is stood for the kid, it's important for uh, the child's future educational trajectories, you know. Of course, some of us will argue that uh, oh, it doesn't really matter, you know, like, uh, I mean, in, in my generation, I didn't go to a brand name primary school, the school already shut down, but, you know, I still turn out all right, <laughs> but this doesn't happen, uh, if you tell uh, contemporary parents this, they won't buy this, right, uh, because I think they are all caught up, like I said, in this neoliberal parenting and uh, the kind of emotional uh, economy around school choice, you know, where they are all trying to uh, secure a future that is so uncertain for their kids, you know. And this has become a, a, a family life project of life making, you know, even though it's un uncertain. Okay, I think uh, on that note, I think I've said enough for you to uh, uh, think over what I've said. Yeah. Thank you so much, Aaron. I think those were really very insightful and very a, a lot of different questions for Jackie to think about and consider. And we do have quite a lot of questions. Um, and they're so rich that if people don't mind, we will try to extend it by 10 minutes or so, so that we can calmly get through them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is that all right with Aaron and Jackie in particular? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So I will I will just go down the list, although some of them seem to um, have a little bit of repetition, but I'll, I'll maybe read the first three for now. And in answering them, if you find that you also want to respond to some of the really important comments and questions that Aaron raised, maybe you could also build that, that in, yeah? Okay, so uh, the first question um, comes from Dennis Yeo. Um, two examples, the two examples you provided suggested that being happy and emotionally secure is mutually exclusive from a parent securing a place in a reputed school. I'm not sure if that is accurate. I could work to get my child into a high quality school and still provide a loving family environment. I guess this is more a comment and maybe you wanna to speak to how perhaps uh, scripts that are seem contradictory, maybe how you wanna make sense of narratives that may appear uh, contradictory, but how they, they might sp uh, actually sit together. The second question from uh, Jing Yao is, um, you mentioned this toward the end of your sharing about different contextual factors and personal narratives which shape Gyasu parenting. The immediate factors and variables which come to mind could be parental occupation, number of children, alumni status and affiliation. I was wondering about how parents, mothers, parents or mother's own primary school and education trajectories and even perceptions of meritocracy might have shaped how they approach their children's own choices. 
So I guess the question is to what degree you talk to people maybe about their own trajectories or to what degree people talked about their own experiences when they're talking about what they hope for their children. Um, a third question. Thank you all. Well, so did you interview any homeschooled uh, or homeschooling parents, I guess? So it's a straightforward methodological question. Let me sneak in one final one, um, which is a question from Jing Heng. I want to know whether social networks came up in the data from the interviewees because there are certain information and informal knowledge like quality of staff, school culture, et cetera, that circulate through networks of friends or family rather than through general online searches. So maybe you could say a little bit more about how it was people came to understand what their responsibilities were as parents and, and how to think about risk. Um, okay, let me see how many of these I can tackle. Thank you so much, everybody, for your questions. And Aaron, those were some really, really uh, insightful and really useful comments, um, especially as I'm in this stage where I am still developing my theoretical framework. So some of the directions that you pointed me in, I'll definitely be pursuing. Um, I just wanted to mention something, um, just picking up on, yeah, your idea of um, social class and like class fragments and how they experience risk and responsibility. I think this was a little of what I was trying to get at at the end where I was talking about um, how these scripts of security might be classed. And you mentioned, yeah, low middle class parents, they are very nervous, right? They experience more anxiety perhaps. Um, and I, I do think that was something that I um, saw a little bit of. And I think it's interesting to pair this um, focus on like, yeah, how different class fragments of the middle class experience risk and responsibility with, with these notions of parental responsibility and what exactly we are asking parents to be responsible for, right? Because in the presentation, I talked a lot about how parents feel like they're being made responsible for choosing a good school. But at the same time, there's also this increasing discourse of parents needing to be responsible for their children's emotional well-being, um, especially as recently we've been talking a lot about mental health among youth in Singapore, and a lot of these mental health issues are blamed on gas parents, right? And so if lower middle class parents are the parents who are more likely to adopt these kinds of gas parenting styles because they feel responsible for managing their children's risk, um, they may also be the same parents who are um, subject to accusations that they are being irresponsible when it comes to managing their children's emotional well-being, right? So they're kind of caught in between, I think, these two different scripts of parental responsibility, and that may be something that um, I may uh, look at a little bit more in, my, in, my, in the rest of my interviews. Um, okay, so that's, that's just a very quick response for now. Um, to the questions, so yeah, definitely the case that Parents, um, it's, not, it's not mutually exclusive, right? Like being emotionally secure is not, not mutually exclusive from securing a place in a reputed school. Um, I think what I was trying to draw was just that for parents who um, choose to opt out of that script of security of going for a reputed school, um, they tend to fall back more on this emotional security narrative. But 
indeed, parents do um, definitely kind of piece together uh, a narrative of security from these multiple different scripts. So Jinyao, your question, yeah, different um, contextual factors and personal narratives that might shape Gatsu parenting, uh, parental occupation, number of children. Yeah, so, so I, did, I did get to ask parents about their own primary school and education trajectories. It was not always straightforward um, to draw this out of them. More often we dove into it if parents spontaneously brought it up themselves. Um, so parents would say things like what I said earlier, you know, I went to a neighborhood, neighborhood school and yeah, you know, like there were a lot of uh, bangs, aliens, and it really was like a distracting school environment. And so I really care about my um, students. Uh, I really care about my children going to a good school, right? That kind of discourse. But there's also like another type of parent that went to neighborhood schools and um, say things like, oh, I went to a neighborhood school that was fine. Like I turned out fine, right? Um, and one thing that I want to analyze a little more closely is whether these parents seem to be the ones that are in more um, like well-paying professional high status jobs now, because I wonder whether that discourse of like, oh, I went to a neighborhood school and turned out fine is kind of a, a, a denial of the real effects that schools have on outcomes, because maybe these were parents that came from um, backgrounds themselves where they had more parental resources, you know, to sort of protect them um, against a school environment that could have um, made um, succeeding in school a little more difficult for them. So that's just one, one thought I have in response to your question. Um, homeschooling families, I did not talk to any families who are exclusively homeschooling. Um, there was one parent who mentioned a um, couple of parents, I think, who mentioned thinking about homeschooling. Um, I think homeschooling is a, an interesting phenomenon. And one thing, just one thing that I picked up, like very anecdotally from these parents was um, that, yeah, like, like the desire to homeschool might in a way reflect their disillusionment with the education system. I think that is something that comes out of the literature on homeschooling in the US as well. Um, that was just the case with these couple of moms that I talked to who were considering homeschooling. They themselves had um, not had a great experience in school and they were also feeling like their children were um, not being treated the best or like they as parents were being judged by the school system. Um, and then, what was the last? Oh yeah, social networks. So definitely super a lot of social networks stuff. Um, the, the mother that I talked to uh, the mother I talked about, Annie, who did all of her Google searching, did all of her research on Google. Um, she's the exception. And um, I wanted to talk about her because I thought she gave a good case of what it's like to search without this kind of social network data. But definitely for a lot of the other parents I talked to, um, they do turn to their networks for this kind of informal knowledge. Um, and one parent in particular that I remember talking to, he was saying, yeah, like these days without this kind of data, like results and stuff from MOE, um, that's why we need to rely much more on our um, social networks. So he in particular has a lot of these teacher friends. Um, like you say, he has this informal knowledge about quality of staff and school culture and stuff like that. Um, and so I think the bigger point that that makes me think about is whether in this kind of every school and good school era, um, you see a greater sort of bifurcation in the types of knowledge that different parents have depending on their networks, right? So information that parents have about schools becomes a lot more network dependent, given that um, there's not as much like universally available school information out there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, uh, Jackie. I hope the questioners won't mind, but I went through the questions and I'm going to try and sum them up rather than read them one by one. But we'll keep the, we'll make sure to store these questions so that Jackie has access to, to the full range uh, after this session. A couple more questions to add to the mix. One is whether you could say more about how parents themselves define what good schools are. 
Yeah, and this came up uh, actually a couple of times in the, the questions. Uh, was it merely results and rewards or were parents starting to come up with other kinds of uh, metrics yeah, to, to think about how they define a good school? That's one question. Second, there was a question about, um, I guess the, the, the extent to which you, you might have seen a disjuncture between their perceptions and the realities. So there was a question about to what extent are uh, um, parents' perceptions of school based on certain kinds of factual information? Yeah, and, and to what degree might there be a misunderstanding about either the schools themselves or, um, or um, how to think about education more generally? Um, and then two further questions that I think also relate to what Aaron said earlier. One is the question of class, right? And circling back to this idea that risk, of course, is in reality different uh, across classes, right? Um, not just the perceptions of it, but the realities of risk are different yeah, uh, across uh, socioeconomic lines. And, and so how would you think about addressing that question that is likely to actually keep coming up about your work, right? Uh, and, and how to think about uh, risk both in its kind of real material dimensions as well as, as the perception and how you might tease that out. And then finally, um, I wanted to also circle back to this thing Aaron raised about neoliberal parenting and which was also raised a couple of times in the questions. Um, and in particular, I think, this notion that uh, scholars who've used the idea of governmentality, Foucault's no notion of governmentality, and I know Aaron's work also has engaged with this, um, have talked about how uh, neoliberalism or one aspect of neoliberal governmentality is, is the fact that it's both totalizing and individualizing, right? It both sort of uh, requires a kind of compulsory engagement with certain rationalities of thought and with certain ways of being, but it's also individualizing, putting responsibility at the level of these individual parents, right? And I, I wondered, I mean, this is of course putting you on the spot on a very big question, but but I wonder if you have any initial thoughts about how you might wanna engage with that, the, the kind of big picture lessons people can draw from this very specific empirical case that you have. Um, thanks, Julian, for <laughs> summarizing all of it. I'm like not paying attention at all to the questions, so that's super helpful. So the question about um, yeah, how parents define good schools, is it just about like awards, reputation, results? No, it's definitely not. Um, I think, in fact, one interesting thing is that parents have so many different definitions of what a good school is. I, I think often, okay, often they do talk about like they do end up talking about um, some of these concrete things like PSLE results. Um, but sometimes they'll just mention like, oh, a, a good school and they'll sort of be vague about what that means. Um, and then also, you know, parents, when they look at like school rankings, they have different interpretations of what these rankings mean. So some parents might say like, oh, like being highly ranked means that the teachers are very good or being highly ranked means that um, the you know, the teachers like will look out for the weaker students. Like this is something that I heard quite a bit. Um, so that's just to say that like parents have different interpretations of what rankings mean, even if they're looking at the same kinds of rankings, right? Which to me communicates that like, it's really the hierarchical nature of the information rather than like the substance of what the awards mean or what the rankings mean that help parents to predict that a good school is gonna lead to a good future. That's one, I, one thought. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is that, and I didn't manage to get to this in the presentation, but um, for many, many parents, a good school is really about the good students in the school, right? So you hear a lot of um, class bias, racial bias and discrimination coming out in parent evaluations of what a good school is. And I think, um, you know, they'll say things like, oh yeah, like it's a, it's a Chinese school with more Chinese students. And so like the discipline is gonna be better, right? So it's very like racialized perceptions of school quality. Um, and I feel like, you know, in this conversation that we always have about um, good schools being the ones that have the best academic results, we don't, we end up not talking about this other much more fundamental, but also very like universal um, aspect of 
school quality for parents. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something that comes out a lot in the interview. So thanks for that question. Um, this question about how much do parents, yeah, so what was the question? Like factual information versus misunderstanding, right? Um, whether, yeah, whether like parents are using factual information, I, I yeah, I, I mean, I, I suppose one of the questions is how critical minded parents are in their evaluation of, of um, what is or is not a good school, like what are the influences and how much of it is based on sort of concrete information, I suppose. Yeah, I right. suppose that's a little bit hard to tease out, but but maybe another way of, to think about it was, was it, did you find that there was a lot of misinformation or sort of uh, kind of superficial understanding of what goes on in schools or stereotypes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think it is, and it's maybe an interesting combination of both because yeah, parents will um, cite specific pieces of information. So one like very specific example I can give you is um, this parent who said that in her neighborhood chat group, somebody shared a photo of a student in this school uniform from this primary school um, and the student was like jumping off the car, right? Um, so that's like a, a fact, right? Like someone took a photo of it. But um, then, then the parents in the group, you know, um, take this information and then they generalize about the students in the school, right? And also, and it kind of dovetails with the fact that like this school is the more undersubscribed school. Um, so, so they are sort of taking these two pieces, these two facts, like one being that the school is undersubscribed, and one being that there's this photo of the student jumping off the car, and then um, from there though they are forming this like general stereotypical idea about students in this school. So yeah, that's an interesting question. I'll think about it more. Um, I definitely think it's a combination of both. Um, yeah, especially these days when like school information does come in such a like piecemeal form. Right, right. I yeah. mean, perhaps you could also relate this to an earlier question about networks and to think in terms of what are the hierarchies people have in their minds about whose views or whose information is more important in shaping the kinds of actions they have. Because my understanding also is that parents are often in these very specific social worlds, right? And uh, they, they don't care equally about what everyone thinks. You know, it's very specific people whose judgment they, they may care more about. Anyway, yeah. I think uh, we want to try to get to, oh, did you want to say a little bit more or shall I ask two more questions? No, that's fine. You can go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the other ones need more time. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah. I think Tiffany wanted to ask a question uh, verbally. Tiffany. Yes. Hello. Hi, uh, hi Jackie. Uh, thank hi. you so Great presentation, um, very insightful and thoughtful, uh, where the, um, the key thesis was that um, parents try to um, construct a sense of security amid uncertainty. And I wanted to add on, um, uh, I had more ideas about the theme of uncertainty that were not being explicitly addressed. So I wanted to, I wanted to know how parents actually learn what's at stake. And I think we're circling around this with the idea of what parents think of as a good school, but I think a more there's another uh, more uh, different and more specific question is what is actually at stake here. The um, implicit answer to that is the child's eventual PSLE results, because uh, the implicit assumption is that if kids get into a good school with good programs, this will give them a better chance for their PSLE scores and even the extracurriculars, uh, which is reasonable. But I think there's also a lot more going on in, in your analysis that isn't just outcome oriented. Um, and things I'm hearing are kind of um, respectability politics going on uh, and a desire to project um, a respectable image for the parents, but also for um, uh, for the children. I think there's a lot of uncertainty. I think parents' uh, decision-making processes are informed by more uncertainties than what is a good school. And specifically, there is a lot of uncertainty at the individual level between the school you're 
child gets into at primary one versus how your school, the child actually does in primary six. And there's uncertainty at the individual level, how all the programs and good teaching actually uh, can, can lead to that. Uh, finally, on the topic of neoliberal, uh, neoliberalism and parenting and subject construction, I, what I'm hearing from um, what parents are doing uh, is that they are not just oriented towards uh, outcomes for their children, but, they, but the parents are also, especially the mothers, are also constructing a sense of their own selves. So it's, it's a parental subjectivity construction project. Uh, which also dovetails with um, gendered, uh, with gendered scripts, and I think this could also be a way of uh, the mothers, particularly dealing with uncertainty, because in the uncertainty of how your child will actually perform, the next best thing is to reassure yourself that you tried your best as a parent, that you are a good parent. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, I'm going to sneak one last question in here because this hasn't been raised at all yet. And I think that's it's quite important. Um, it's, it's a question from Ruby. And her question is, I was curious to know if parents of minority racial backgrounds had different criteria for judging good schools by. Not every school offers a full host of mother tongue offerings, cultural CCAs. You mentioned that Chinese parents might have a prejudice for schools that are more Chinese. But what does that look like for families who are not Chinese? Um, yeah, thanks for that question. And thanks, Tiffany, for your really insightful um, comments as well. Also, just want to mention, like, anyone else whose question I didn't get to, feel free to DM me with your email address or contact information if you really want to answer it. I'll get back to you later. Um, so um, just a little, a little response to Tiffany, and we can also talk more offline. Um, thanks for catching that thing about, yeah, um, it's not just about the children's outcomes um, in terms of academic outcomes, PSLE results, things like that. There's also a lot else going on um, in terms of yeah, projecting this respectable image for parents and also for children, right? So the little subtle things like, I want my kids to have good manners, um, for example. And then also what you picked up about, yeah, it's about parents constructing also this sense of um, certainty about their own identities as responsible parents right now, right? And so it's not, like I think often when we talk about school choice, we think about um, outcomes in the future, like securing certain desired outcomes for the future. But what I'm trying to say too is that parents are trying to find a sense of security in the here and now, and how they do that is by constructing this narrative about the future, right? So it's both things kind of at the same time. Um, and for parents, it's like this very kind of practical or pragmatic in the moment um, accomplishment. Yeah, and then this question, um, second question about minority parents. So one thing I didn't mention in my method section is, um, unfortunately, yeah, most of the parents in my sample did end up being Chinese. Um, there were um, a couple of Malay parents and Indian parents. Um, and yes, they definitely did talk about um, language as the key issue. So language was one thing and then the racial diversity of the school, right? So um, and Indian, uh, well, Indian Eurasian mom um, told me that, yeah, like she wanted this particular school, was thinking about this particular school because it had a more diverse mix of students. Um, and that was something that she appreciated as a student herself. And then um, the language issue is definitely a big one, especially when you're thinking about like SAP schools. Um, that's definitely something that um, one of the Malay dads that I talked to felt um, very much shut out of. Um, the school in his neighborhood that he thought was the best school around was a Chinese school. And for a little while he considered like making his kids learn Chinese um, so that they could enter that school, but that ended up um, not, like he, he, he decided that it just wasn't worth the stress for him. Yeah, so those are a couple of um, things that come to mind right away in response to this question. Okay, great. I think we're going to wrap up since we've already taken up uh, more than an hour. Um, do, do either Jacqueline or Aaron want to say one last thing? Uh, as a as a closing, I think Aaron? I said a lot. Aaron, do you want to say? <laughs> uh, I, 
don't have to. I don't know. I just feel that um, because I've worked in Australia and also in Hong Kong now, um, and I think um, I'm, I have to, you know, like uh, I'm able to make comparison. Like I would say that every school in Singapore is a good school, you know, compared to the schools that I've seen in Hong Kong and uh, Australia. So I think parents really need to, you know, uh, <laughs> visit other schools in other countries, then they will know that uh, all schools in Singapore are good schools. Okay, yeah. Jackie, any last uh, thing you would like to say? Yeah, interesting, Erin, that you mentioned that. That is something that I heard from some parents. They would compare the school system in Singapore to the school system, in, especially in like, you know, other Southeast Asian countries. And, and, that, and I think there's something like, you know, racialized about that perception of other schools in other countries, but we can leave that aside for now. Um, but yeah, some parents do kind of draw on that general faith in the Singapore education system and say, oh yeah, like all schools are good schools. Um, and like personally, I do believe, right, like there's some baseline um, uh, like quality that MOE ensures by like resourcing all the schools centrally, for example, um, training all the teachers centrally. Um, and so that's why, like, that's partly why I think it's really important to study perceptions, because I think the differences in school quality that we end up seeing in Singapore um, do stem in large part from these differences in perceptions, which become self-reinforcing yeah. because parents then sort themselves into schools and the good schools end up have, like being good because like the students that go to those schools are the students who are best equipped to um, meet these kinds of standards that are being demanded of them, right? Yeah, so, okay, that's all I'll say. Thank you, okay. thank you so much. Let um, me uh, yeah. thank again, Jackie, for sharing this work in progress. Um, I think people sometimes don't realize what a what a, uh, a risky feeling it is to share work <laughs> in progress and, I, and that people sharing work in progress, in fact, are, are very courageous to do so in, in opening themselves up uh, early on for critique and feedback. Uh, so that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Aaron, for your generosity in, in spirit and time yeah, in giving this feedback to Jackie, which I'm sure will be very useful for her uh, as she wraps up. And thanks very much to the audience. It's been a very engaging, a very engaged audience, wonderful questions. And um, I'm sure, again, that Jackie will benefit greatly from, from looking at them more closely uh, after this morning. Um, up next, we have three more um, seminars that are already scheduled. One is 23rd March. Um, Nuru Amalin Hussein uh, is talking about her PhD project, Seeing, Feeling and Knowing the Smart City. And then on 31st March, uh, Timothy Lowe is going to be talking about uh, sign language and multiculturalism in Singapore. And on 30th April, So Wei Yang is going to talk about the rise of a Singaporean exceptionalism inadvertently modeled on American right traditions. So you can see we have really lots of interesting work done by our young scholars. Um, so I hope many of you will turn up for those as well. Uh, thank you once again for, for your time. Okay, with that, bye-bye. Take care, everybody. Have a good weekend. <laughs>